เรื่องร่างได้ธรรมนูญนะคะก็สวัสดีวันศุกร์แล้วก็ขอต้อนรับทุกท่านเข้าสู่งานสุดสัปดาห์สิ่งแวดล้อมแม่น้ำโขงอาเซียน 2,563 นะคะสิ่งแวดล้อมประชาธิปไตยและชีวิตที่ยงใหญ่กันในภูมิภาคนะคะก็ตื่นเต้นเล็กน้อยค่ะวันนี้ก็รับหน้าที่มาเป็นผู้ดำเนินรายการประจำวันนะคะก็งานจะมีทั้งหมด3วันนะคะวันที่25ถึงวันที่27กันยายน2563นะคะณห้องเพื่อนหอศิลป์กรุงเทพตื่นได้เล็กน้อยชั้น6นะคะหอศิลปะวัฒนธรรมแห่งกรุงเทพมหานครนะคะก็เมื่อครู่มีเพื่อนทางคุณแม่นะคะก็อยากว่าทุกคนจะได้สวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีก็เป็นเดินทางมานะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสดีนะคะสวัสด
last decades on the issues of environment, democracy, and livelihoods. These will be the themes of the first day of uh, this Mekong ASEAN Environmental Week. In the next two years, uh, so we will be uh, discussing how things have uh, occurred and how people have been affected by the environmental uh, issues as well as politics and governments as we all know that the we are facing the climate crisis at the moment and you can hear that you can see that uh, the uh, climate is actually uh, becoming more violent and uh, every country is being affected. China as well is being uh, under the, uh, the cyclone flooding. So before no, we have once uh, had a seminar on stop the damming the Mako River. We knew that there were plans uh, to build 13 dams uh, on the mainstream Mekong. The Mekong River is an international river. And for sure, the, this is an international river. The, the policies of all the countries uh, uh, in the region uh, are involved uh, in how we can use the river or uh, live on the river together in the future. For those who are not here, you can still uh, come uh, in person, but as, as well as uh, watch us on Facebook 2020 MAEW and also on Thai PBS channel. So today, let's uh, get on to the first uh, session of today, that is the uh, background information on the uh, organizing of the environment, democracy, livelihood, and the regional integration uh, seminar today. So I'd like to invite Kun Prem Ridi Daoruyang. Thank you. Thank you for introducing me. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Paramridi Daoroyang, and I have to thank you all again for participating in our uh, Mekong ASEAN Environmental Week, uh, nicknamed MEL. So this is the second time we are holding this Environmental Week. And uh, last year, uh, it was held a bit earlier than this year. The co-organizers are very pleased to finally be able to 
hold this uh, event uh, amidst the difficult situations, as we all know, with uh, all the uncertainties surrounding us. I'd like to take uh, some time to talk about the way uh, our thoughts about this uh, event. As we know, the Southeast Asian region is a very outstanding region uh, in terms of natural resources. And not the natural resources that we have in our region form the basis of our cultures uh, in the set the people who have settled uh, in the region and, and they are all relied on the land of the forest, forest, forest for thousands, thousands of years. years. Yes. What is what outstanding is, 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 is the Cambodian kingdom, kingdom that the, 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 uh, the culture that the culture that built Angkor Wat uh, was, uh, was the culture that was related directly to Tam Le Sap in Cambodia. If you look at the uh, overview, there are two parts of Southeast, Southeast Asia, the mainland Southeast Asia and the maritime Southeast Asia. Uh, these two parts have uh, half and half of the countries of Southeast Asia. Both, uh, both parts together Con constitutes uh, three quarters of biodiversity in the world. That is the richness of this region. If you look at the main mainland Southeast Asia, the Mekong River, the Mekong region actually takes up almost all the area of mainland Asia, four countries plus Myanmar, and the there are two, two rivers, two main rivers in this region, South Wind and Mekong. So 60 million uh, people uh, rely on this river. And the, the Mekong River has also created uh, the area the, in the lowland that is Don Le Sap. This is the the biggest uh, internal uh, lake and well known for fisheries, freshwater fisheries. And the water in Tan Le Sap is actually, actually comes from the Mekong River. Uh, the fish as well. The fish in 70% of the varieties of fish uh, in Tan Le Sap comes from the Mekong River. At the same time, the you cannot uh, separate the natural resources issues from politics and governments within our own region, as well as politics uh, of the Southeast Asia with other big power and trade, uh, con trade partners. If you look back uh, 40, 50 years ago before the eruption of the Indochina war, the international financial institution together with the US engineers proposed a set of dams on the mainstream Mekong. At that time the US, the US was still was just has just built the uh, Hoover Dam. So they recommended uh, building dams on the Mekong River. But before uh, the construction happened the in the China war erupted. So that was stopped. But at the same time, with the communist threats uh, happening in the region, so the, re the area of Damakong have been uh, ravaged by uh, the development, the uh, accelerated development uh, to trying to uh, change the, uh, the, 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 the scenario. So then after the country, some countries in Southeast Asia became socialist, the, 
they, there was an idea to set up the ASEAN associations of Southeast Asian nations that is basically based on the the four or five countries that are not socialist in order to try to to block the socialist countries. Uh, so the, we have a lot of investment has been carried out uh, during this time. In the last 30 years, the, uh, our neighboring countries, socialist countries, opened uh, their countries up. And even though they were still under socialist government, but their economy is still into uh, neoliberal. So we are now in the same boat, all of us in the same boat in terms of the uh, de having to deal with the effects of the economic development uh, with, in, in, with the exploitation of the natural resources in the country. So, of course, the market economy uh, will uh, take up any, uh, any available uh, areas. So now, that, that is what we cannot uh, ignore is that is the fact that our region is not the same as 50 years ago. We don't have uh, plenty natural resources to be uh, available for us. We are now facing big problems uh, in terms of climate crisis. Uh, and but this is a, a chicken and egg kind of issue because we don't know if climate change actually exacerbated our, the problems that we have created. Uh, is it because the large projects that we have been that have been carried out in the past decades have also contributed to climate change? Uh, just uh, I just want to cite a very a clear example. That is the report of the Mekong River Commission, which is a uh, regional mechanism uh, uh, the, about 10 years ago. The Mekong River Commission uh, came out with a research report that is the strategic environmental assessment of hydropower dams on the mainstream Mekong. The proposal for to build 12 dams had already uh, started. The MRC came out with this report to assess what the impact would be from all these 12 dams. And they looked at the environment, the, also the economic effects. Will it help alleviate um, poverty? Uh, what would happen physically in uh, to the river, like sediments and nutrients uh, in the area, as well as the livelihoods of the people in the area. This report actually showed huge uh, impact. Uh, and they proposed four options. The first option is not to build any dams on the mainstream. Secondly, to delay the construction for 10 years. Uh, in the meantime, to study the uh, possible impacts uh, properly. But the third uh, option is to build gradually. And the fourth option is to go ahead and build all the dams. In this report, it was uh, clear that the, the most affected country in the short term and long term is Cambodia and Vietnam. So that means the Tonle Sap as well as the Mekong Delta. And this, in the, the year afterwards, uh, the Lao PDR decided to go ahead with Sayabuli Dam uh, construction uh, and followed by Don Sahong Dam. And now we're having Luang Prabang and another Senakam also being planned. So that means that the MRC report could not deter the countries on the Mekong to think twice before building the dams and definitely could not stop, could not uh, delay the plan uh, made by Lao PDR. 
and it cannot, it could not uh, convince the Mekong countries to discuss uh, the issue seriously in order to prevent any harm uh, uh, in the future. So right now what we are facing is the dying Mekong. Some people said it's already dead. And the, this another uh, of the MRC report actually came out um, uh, recently about the drying up of the Mekong. That means the Tan Le Sap, uh, which is uh, usually receives the water from the Mekong River. Uh, they don't, any, uh, the Tan Le Sap is drying up. And that is a crisis that is actually predicted by the report 10 years ago, as well in the Mekong Delta. Even though after uh, 10 years, uh, after, after the report, the Mekong country government still ignore the, the, uh, the, the prediction. And Thailand, Thailand now has just admitted that it has an oversupply of electricity by 40%. But for us from the civil society, we think that's 65% oversupply. But the Thai government continued uh, to uh, buy electricity uh, and sign contracts to buy electricity from the neighboring countries, even though the GDP is actually going negative, uh, which is against the forecast. And it seems that the government believes that the GDP will just keep going up uh, like a rocket. Uh, so the question now is uh, what are we facing at the moment? Uh, all that, uh, what, I, what I have said is not actually to come and blame uh, anybody, any parties on, to talk only about problems, but uh, actually our intention, our hope is that uh, we want to showcase the issues of the environment which we believe is the most important issues that are related to all our livelihoods. We want to present the issues uh, from the, by the people who have worked on the issues for a long time. So we have representatives from civil society organizations, representatives of the people, the villagers, and some artists who are uh, actually uh, thinking, we are all thinking about the issues and looking for ways to uh, way out of the, of the problem. And we hope that this space uh, will generate uh, more discussions, more sharing uh, of, uh, of our issues and solutions. And we hope that Thailand can lead in terms of finding ways out of these uh, problems. So finally, I'd like to thank the co-organizers. Uh, so seven, Project 7R, seven, uh, ETO, Watch, uh, Focus on the Global South, and Thai PBS, which is a key sponsor uh, for live streaming of the events this year. Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, being interested in our event. Apart from the seminars, we, we also have short films, uh, all good, very good films. And we, we have to thank those uh, producers that allow us to, to show the films here. And also, we have to thank uh, the speakers that are uh, uh, in other countries that actually have agreed to uh, make the presentation on a video uh, to show us here. And so, so we hope that uh, this event will prove that even though we are under the COVID-19 pandemic, we still do not lack uh, the intention to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kun Premrudi, Project 7R.
And actually, in Premedi, we we'll have to be moderating this uh, the panel discussion on looking back on the environment, democracy, and livelihoods uh, issues in the Mekong region. We have four speakers. We have uh, two on video from other countries, and two Thai speakers uh, will be uh, speaking here too. I think they are all here, so I'd like to invite Kun Thara Bokamsi. So when I'd like to invite Kun Thara Bokamsi. Kun Penchom Satang. You see, is she here? She's on the way, actually. So I would like to now give the microphone to Kun Prem Rudi on looking back in decades of the environment, democracy, and livelihoods issues in the regional in the connection. And because of the COVID issue, I'm not sure whether COVID is actually the result of the environmental impact of uh, uh, that. But please, Kun Prem Reddy. Thank you. Uh, may I just wear a mask? I don't need uh, to announce the the title of this uh, this session, right? Because it's uh, similar to the title of the Mekong ASEAN Environmental Week. As explained, we have four speakers. The first two speakers are outside the country. The first person is in the Philippines, Kunet uh, Dano. Kunet Dano has been our friends and she worked for ETC Group, and which is an old organization. Uh, she lives in the Philippines. ETC Group works on changes in the economic changes, uh, but they look at a variety of uh, issues. Uh, uh, particularly uh, current is the digital digital system that is being used uh, uh, by uh, large uh, corporations. I think Kunet Dano will be talking about 25 minutes. And then we will in, have the other speakers then we could do some exchange um, questions and answers. Then Kun Kamo from uh, Cambodia will, I will ex uh, introduce uh, the speakers uh, one by one later on. So I like to start with Kunet Daniel, who will be speaking on the video. actually requested to make a presentation on environmental governance, corporate interests, and democracy in Southeast Asia. I'm very happy to provide this contribution to this um, conference um, and welcome. Good morning, good day to, to colleagues. Uh, first, when we talk of environmental governance, many people will always ask, what is it? And if we look into the, the literature of what, of what the definition of environmental governance is, it's quite vague, actually. Like, but I did look into um, some of the definitions offered by um, the UN Environment Program, and 
the common thing that always comes up when we talk of environmental governance is it's a process that advocates for sustainable development as a supreme consideration for managing human species through whole system management involving the government, civil society, and the when we talk of environmental governance, um, a part of sustainable development it also um, involves the issue of good governance, rule of law, and compliance and enforcement. Um, and in most cases, it is not just about discussing uh, policies, but um, implementing um, and enforcing and even monitoring um, the application and implementation of environmental law um, and regulations. And many of us working across um, different issues on the environment in the Mecca and in Southeast Asia have encountered it as we work on forestry, mining, watershed management, and in my case, um, on general policy at the global, regional, and national level on, on the environment. And it is also no surprise um, when we talk about environmental governance that there are a number of mechanisms where government business and civil society sit down um, in one table um, and in one room to discuss the environmental um, aspects of policies and also um, processes at the national, regional, international level. It's also striking that in many cases um, where mechanisms and processes are laid down, for environmental governance, governance, the business and civil society end up um, in one in one table. So I give um, here some examples that I have been particularly um, involved in at the global level, like the UN Environment Assembly, um, not just to provide a seat for businesses um, in the Environment Assembly, but also provide a separate forum for for them, which they call science policy development forum. And this is really glittering events with high level personalities all paid for by business. While we as civil society work for public interest, we are non profit and we receive grants from foundations, even from 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 government. Um, this are, I'm referring to legitimate environmental civil society, for example. Um, it's not the same as those um, lobbying for the interest of corporations to sell them. And as I mentioned, for example, it is us to see Shell um, sitting as the, civil, as the business representative in a body that is supposed to talk about clean technology to address um, the need for climate mitigation and climate adaptation. So it's not the same. And we see this also very concretely in the region, in ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, where ABAC, the ASEAN Business Advisory Council has been institutionalized for the past almost 20 years, so since 2003, as a formal body for the business industry to provide advice and views uh, from business um, into the processes of the ASEAN. And there's no similar process in ASEAN um, that provides um, an institutional for civil society provide advice to um, ASEAN. Um, the forum, for example, the ASEAN Civil Forum or the ASEAN Civil Society Conference, the Civil Society Organizing in 2005, um, is not even institutionalized in the sense that ASEAN does not, um, in, does not um, recognize it as a permanent body or a permanent process, unlike um, ABA or ABA. We've also seen, of course, a lot of corporate lobby on environment and food issues in, in Southeast Asia um, in particular. Many of us working on agriculture are familiar with in, in industry, business and industry associations that serve as official lobby groups, um, are also recognized by governments such as Stockland. For a lot that we present them in policy meetings at the national and at the regional level, and more familiar at the level of the of the region, particularly in Southeast Asia, is of course RFP, 
the rounding for sustainable um, palm oil um, production, which has hundreds of members um, that represent the different parts of the palm oil um, industry, so from producers all the way to uh, processing and manufacturing. So you have big names, huge, huge names like Nestle, Unilever, Charuet from Papan, um, CP. On that end, the scale of sitting as part of the members of the round table are small community enterprises dealing with palm oil. And of course, uh, as you shift into mineral extraction, you have chamber mines at the national level. In the Philippines, for example, one of the most powerful um, industry lobbies, particularly in the mining sector, of course, the chamber of mines, which is the association of all the mining um, companies operating um, in the Philippines that will actually pay um, to represent them in various policy discussions, also indirect lobbying, both formal and informal, um, with the government and also the media um, on the issue of mineral, mineral policy. And these are, these are examples of how environmental governance um, operates. And bear in mind, as I said earlier, that environmental governance main goal or top most um, agenda is sustainable development. How sustainable development is defined and also interpreted and um, operationalized uh, depends solely, of course, on how the place are, are uh, the dynamics of the place are actually actualized, um, are actualized um, in reality and how they play out. Um, as we move into the post industrial revolution, we also see new players, new industry players um, that are not commonly uh, associated with the environment or including agriculture that are gaining ground in terms of their roles, investment, and also political support. Like in the past uh, five years, we've seen companies like Amazon uh, going into food and agriculture, the same way Microsoft. This company has started collaborating with um, pharmacies and um, retailers uh, such as Walgreens uh, because of the control over retail. And again, closer to home, like those of us um, looking into into the the Belt and Road Initiative would probably um, know as well that below the radar of the Belt and Road Initiative is of course the digital world. And the digital still grows, of course, is not just an initiative of the Chinese government base, but also brings it forward and brings with it um, advancing um, on, um, on, on, the, on China's fourth industrial revolution agenda are the big um, STEM companies, the so called bad that that's by to Alibaba, Tencent, and Xiaomi. And um, there are a number of things. Of interesting examples of how big tests มีในเมืองจีนเนี่ยก็มีบริษัทใหญ่อย่างเช่นบิ๊กเทคเนี่ยบิ๊กเทคกับบิ๊กแอกริคัลเจอร์เกษตรใหญ่กับเทคโนโ
สุขแต่แล้วมันรวมทั้งพวกฟินเทคหรือเทคโนโลยีทางการเงินต่างๆด้วยนะที่บริษัทอย่างใช้เทคโนโลยีบล็อกเชนที่จะเป็นตัวควบคุมการค้าขายต่างๆนะนี่คือแนวโน้มที่เป็นความท้าทายอย่างมากในแง่ของความท้าทายที่มาจากพิกเน็ตบิ๊กเทคแล้วแล้วมันยังมีฉันยังไม่ออกลงรายละเอียดมากขึ้นแต่ว่าอย่างที่บอกนะคะมันไม่ใช่เฉพาะบิ๊กเทคเข้าไปเล่นในเรื่องของเสียงแวดล้อมเรื่องของการเกษตรแต่บริษัทที่มีเดิมอย่างเนสเล่หรือยูนิเลเวอร์หรือซีพีเจริญพ่อขพันก็เข้าไปอยู่ในช่วยกับเขาปฏิวัติอุตสาหปฏิวัติเทคโนโลยีกับเขาด้วยซึ่งก็มีกำลังคุยเรื่องปัญญาประดิษฐ์อยู่โมในเรื่องนี้อยู่รวมทั้งการอินเทอร์เน็ตออฟติงส์หรือการควบคุมอุปกรณ์ทุกอย่างด้วยอินเทอร์เน็ตซึ่งมันจะทำให้บริษัทเหล่านี้สามารถที่จะสอดส่องแล้วก็ดูแลในเรื่องของห่วงโซ่อุปทานทั้งหมดและข้อมูลทั้งหมดที่มีอยู่ในในในช่วงนี้เนี่ยเราจะเห็นเลยในช่วงของการระบาดโควิดว่าบริษัทที่เกี่ยวข้องกับเทคโนโลยีเรื่องดูบริษัทใหญ่ๆนะบอยเออร์ซินเจนต้าซึ่งซินเจนต้าตอนนี้เนี่ยเป็นของเจ้าของคือเคนชัยน่าหรือบริษัทของจีนซึ่งและ BASF เหมือนกันกำลังมีภาคีเป็นหุ้นเป็นเป็นหุ้นส่วนกับบริษัทที่ควบคุม Big Data ทั้งหมดแล้วรวมทั้งใช้เทคโนโลยีในการที่จะหลายๆอย่างในด้านการเกษตรอย่างเช่นมีการร่วมมือกับบริษัทที่ของจีนที่ผลิตเครื่องโดรนหรือไอจานบินที่เอาวิ่งไปพ่นยาหรือไปฆ่ายาฆ่ามแมลงซึ่งแล้วก็ซินเจนท่าก็เขาร่วมกับ JI DJI ซึ่งกำลังผลิตตัวไอ้โดรนสำหรับการเกษตรโดยเฉพาะด้วยแล้วนอกจากนั้นก็ยังมีเครื่องแทรกเตอร์ขนาดเล็กสำหรับเกษตรกรรายย่อยเพื่อที่จะช่วยแก้ปัญหาประเด็นแรงงานในการในภาคเกษตรราคาแพงขึ้นก็หันไปใช้เทคโนโลยีเครื่องจักรกลแทนดังนั้นเราก็จะต้องดูในเรื่องว่านี่คือการปฏิวัติทางด้านเทคโนโลยีที่บอกว่าเป็นปฏิวัติครั้งที่4กำลังมีผลกระทบในเรื่องของการแย่งยึดที่ดินด้วยแล้วเราก็รู้ว่าเกษตรกรรายย่อยก็จะถูกเบียดขับออกไปมันมีเรื่
the EPC has been looking into this, and our conclusion is that um, this technology barely look at the the needs of small farms. You no, know? the the profit motivation is first and foremost, and it's not even farmers who make the decision, but corporations that are behind um, the development of these technologies and in most cases across the region are actually supported by governments that are equally excited about being part of the so-called port industrial revolution without asking and who are benefiting. And going back to the question on, on who really um, makes the decision and is this really going to support those who are left behind? Um, in the development equation. So looking into the implications of, of misdevelopment, corporate interest, um, environmental um, governance, and also the increasing adoption of port industrial revolution um, in the environment sphere, um, looking at the implications on democracy, it actually bears to mind um, the, the, the equation that I showed um, earlier um, in my slides on the role of government, state, business, um, and civil society. Um, now, um, civil society's role is becoming more and more marginalized as the, as the um, hoopla or the excitement over the fourth industrial revolution gets bigger. And in the, in the other um, spectrum, it's that it gives more prominent role for big agriculture and for big technology and policy and decisions um, around the environment at the national, regional, and global level. Uh, we see this um, more clearly as we go into examples in the region, like CP or Charuan Pokapan. It's a very good example where you have um, board of directors or officials that are um, part of that revolving door between corporations and, and government or even the military um, circle. I was just looking at the profile, for example, of the CEO of, of CP and the current role of the CEO um, in government bodies deciding on education, deciding on policies. You know, like, is it hard to imagine how um, people who are selling big tech or big agriculture um, to be not to be promoting uh, to be promoting their interest um, in this government policy. So there's also a lot of ethical issues um, involved in here as governments become more desperate to bring in business and industry into the policy making sphere. Also, um, there are bigger and bigger concerns about the surveillance um, surveillance and implications on people's rights of bring in big technology um, in spheres um, related to agriculture, food, and the environment. Um, the same drones actually take pictures of the farm um, to map out pests and diseases and also practices are exactly the same drones that are being used to um, monitor um, um, the, 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 the uh, activities of environmental defenders you know, in mining areas or in um, forest forest areas, um, particularly indigenous people. Who, you, who controls these technologies makes this um, a very critical um, issue. Like who uses um, these technologies and for what are, are things that we should interrogate, um, that they should not be left in the hands of business and not in the hands of the state. And of course, um, there's a lot of violation of consent and suppression of dissent um, in, as, as a result of this. Um, like when um, drones take pictures of, of a farmer's uh, field, uh, there are actually um, issues um, that are coming up in the north, for example, where, where these drones um, are used by um, technology companies in partnership with big agriculture are actually um, being used without the consent of smaller uh, farms um, whose um, territory whose area are actually being um, surveilled uh, for purposes of building big data um, to help um, big corporations um, design better products, quote unquote, that are more custom built to farmers. Needs. And in the area of consumers, um, we talk of democracy. It, it also, of course, involves um, to a lot of extent choices. Like we may be, we may have benefited 
quote unquote, from the use of e-commerce um, during the time of the lockdown across the region. Um, some months ago and continuing in some areas up to now, but we have to, to, to be very um, conscious that using um, e-commerce and also dependence of digital um, technologies um, is, does not come for free. Um, those of us who have, who have followed, for example, the controversy around Facebook's uh, business model that sells um, data from its users, being users, um, to companies that are not just selling things, but are selling political uh, platform and also ad, um, advising and providing consultancies for politicians, are very much aware of this on how social media um, information that we provide as users are being used, no? uh, not just to profit, but also to manipulate choices, political choices in many in many instances, as we've seen in elections um, in the U.S. and also ele some elections um, in the region. Also, um, um, when it comes to uh, farmers' rights and indigenous people's rights, um, dependence on um, the fourth industrial revolution and bringing this in the sphere of the environment, in particular um, in the area of minerals, forestry, um, food production, and agriculture, would tend to marginalize further um, the knowledge and um, traditional systems of farmers and indigenous communities that were built across generations. Across communities in the region, um, these are marginalized and considered not even knowledge, but um, just local practices. I've been to many um, discussions where this has been the framing, and we have to continue challenging that that much of the food security, much of the environmental conservation, and also um, responses to um, this in, in, in all this, um, in all this um, excitement over um, the application of the fourth industrial revolution on, on the environment here. So um, I think these are um, some thoughts that I'd like to um, share, that we could open up um, discussions on this as we discuss and also shape um, the future of democracy in, in Southeast Asia. They had my discussion there, so thanks for listening. Thank you, Ned. Uh, Ned, are you there? Uh, hello, Ned. Go. คุณเน็ตได้พูดถึงประเด็นหลายประเด็นนะคะซึ่งหลายคนที่พวกเราก็ไม่ได้ติดตามนะคะ Hi Net Hello um, Thank you very much for your presentation uh, You have listened to yourself right just now and I understand that you also have another uh, page I mean the last part of your talk I can barely hear Yeah you cannot hear um, can you hear better now? Yeah, I can hear better now. Right. Yeah, so um, I understand that you still have another page as a recommendation, your last slide, that you would like to uh, talk to us. But let me just very quickly uh, ask our audience here if they have the, a question for you. Um, คุณเนทก็จะมีอีกนิดหน่อยนะคะที่เขาอยากจะเสนอแนะแต่ว่าอยากจะถอดขอให้พวกเราถามก่อนถ้าใครมีคำถามนะคะกับคุณเนทดาน
uh, among these viable alternatives that have been proven by many studies to work and also to benefit um, um, small-scale farmers, family farms, and um, and smallholders um, is agroecological practices that are actually built on the knowledge systems of the communities, in which both indigenous and local communities, so really have to aggressively um, promote um, this um, knowledge system as viable alternatives. Um, second, of course, um, is to build um, shorter and closer relationship uh, between consumers and, uh, and producers to be able to uh, promote uh, models of shorter supply chains. And I think um, many experiences in Southeast Asia during the lockdown period, um, the first three months of the pandemic, have shown how useful um, in promoting um, livelihood, also in advancing advancing um, consumer producer um, linkages, direct linkages. Um, if we have these um, models of um, shorter supply chain that actually allows producers to directly supply to consumers and there are models um, that Thailand has actually shown um, on consumer um, supported um, agriculture that have um, also worked um, so well during the, the pandemic. Also, um, um, we need to, of course, um, show that um, there are um, other non-technological um, technological options um, to be able to address um, development challenges. Rather than being trapped on technological fixed mind um, in addressing problems like food security, climate change, and environmental challenges, we have to broaden the discussion that there are innovations that are promoted by communities, um, social innovation, and also a lot of practices that have been proven to be safe and efficient and appropriate um, for, for the needs of to address the needs of communities um, work um, to broaden the discussion that it's not about um, technological solutions or technological fixes alone to solve the problems caused by technology. And lastly, um, there is um, this important um, um, option about interrogating um, technologies that we are not just passive recipients of technologies, but we should be active um, for, uh, users and consumers um, to push for participatory and transparent um, assessment of technologies before they are deployed in communities, um, assessing and evaluating the potential impacts on the environment, on livelihood and cultures are prerequisite before any technology is deployed and that choice of deploying and adopting technology should lie um, in the hands of people. So I'd like to um, highlight those proposed action points. I'm sure um, there are many that are um, that we as a collective can can come up with. Thank you so much, Ned. Uh, I'm very sorry we have a very tight schedule you now. So if we don't have any hands here to uh, raise the question, I think we have to move to the next speaker. But yeah, uh, the issue that you gave us has been very important and of course we should continue discussing on this uh, in the future. But uh, if you have time, please stay with us, no? listen to other yeah. speakers. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best yeah. to the conference. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. ขออนุญาตต่อเลยนะคะเอ่อคนที่สองของเราเนี่ยคือยังแสงโกมานะคะคุณโกมานี่เป็นก็เป็นเพื่อนเก่าเช่นกันนะคะเรารู้จักเอ
two years ago, Goma decided uh, to join a political party called uh, Grassroots, uh, Grassroots Democratic Party. It's a small party in Cambodia. Uh, that so we invited Goma to talk about uh, this, uh, why he decided to, uh, after his success in working with farmers, to uh, become, to, to work with a political party. Uh, Kun Goma has about a 16 minutes presentation. I'm not sure that he's on, whether he's online yet. So just please listen to Yang Sang Goma. I would like to uh, talk to you about which my experience uh, from working with NGO uh, to political party, uh, especially how a political party and uh, good policy can solve uh, social problems in Cambodia. I would like to uh, organize my talk in, in, in three parts. Uh, the first part is about the Cambodian context. Uh, second part about my past work uh, with NGO, and the third part, actually the main part, is about my work with the grassroots Democratic Party. So about the Cambodian context, as you may know that Cambodia is still a varying society. We have about 60 million people, and about 70% uh, of our population still small farmer and they are living in throughout 1400 villages in throughout the country but there is change uh, there are more and more diversification of economy and more and more people uh, migrate out of uh, the village especially or mostly young people uh, to work in in the urban area to work in other sector and uh, to work in in other country, uh, especially in, in Thailand. And so far, I know there's about one million migrant workers uh, now in Thailand. About the political system, so since 1993, uh, Cambodia adopted uh, the system of parliamentary democracy every five years their election, and now we have 125 member of parliament. <coughs> and uh, since 2002, uh, we also have a local election that people, villagers, can elect their uh, local leader, uh, we call a commune concert. Concern, concerning my work with uh, NGO, so I started uh, to work with NGO in 1995 after I come back from my study in Germany. So first I worked for the NGOs, but I also involved in uh, teaching, in giving lecture at the university as well. Uh, from 1997 to 2015, so I, I founded the NGO called uh, SEDAC, Cambodian Center for Study and Development in Agriculture. So I was the uh, director and president of SEDAC uh, from uh, 1997, uh, 2015. So we have been working to support a uh, small farmer, 100,000 of small farmers throughout the country to improve their life, to improve agriculture production, uh, to develop farmer organization and networks. But as you know, uh, there are limitations in terms of NGO work, and I myself I, I want to help, I want to support all farmers in Cambodia. And also to support farmers not only in terms of agriculture, there's more complex issue 
expressed by the farmer and villager. They show a pulse of education, access to land, total uh, car rides, etc. So therefore, uh, we, I myself, with other NGO leader and community leader, uh, we, we decide together that we want to do something more for Cambodia. So we, we, we started a new political party, uh, we call a grassroots democratic party, uh, in short, uh, GDP. But why and what for? So, first, as I mentioned before, we want to scale up our experience to bring up the issue of the grassroots to the national level. We want to ensure uh, genuine grassroots representative at the local and national assembly uh, to influence, to formulate policy and strategy uh, to solve uh, their problem and to contribute to, to build the nation. And especially, we want to build new political culture in our country. The political, political culture focuses on good policy, focuses on competing good policy based on core values of solidarity, justice, non-violence, to promote tolerance to different political groups, to promote political empowerment, political empowerment of farmers, of youth, of women, and to, norm to normalize politics. Everyone can be a good politician. So, in short, it will promote a good policy to solve the social problem, to promote political empowerment, and tolerance to different political groups. And we want to develop an example of how political party with intra uh, democracy party, because we seem that to build democratic institu institution at national level, at local level, starting also to build uh, intra-democracy in our own political party. And we want to get opportunity uh, to develop a good example of democratic government starting from one uh, particular commune. So with GDP, with political party, uh, so we can achieve this, we can get opportunity to do something uh, to, 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 to present a good example on how the democratic government can work at party level, at commune level, and then at national level. So we, as a political party, we compete in election. You know, as NGO, we cannot compete in election. So we, 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 we have competed in two election already. Uh, first in 2017, so the local election, the commune election. Our goal is to, as I mentioned before, to to get a opportunity to lead a new commune to be an example of democratic governance. But we were not able to get enough support, but we get uh, support in three communes with uh, five councillors. But we don't have, in all the city communes, we don't have the majority uh, to lead the local government. But our councillor are uh, working very hard to promote new political culture, to uh, introduce policy change at the local level. And we gain a lot of experience. And that's our new experience. Also, we, we also participate in the national election in 2018, and we prepare ourselves for the next election. So, in 2018, we, we, we competed in the national election. We, we put candidates in all provinces of Cambodia. And we, we are the only political party uh, so far that can bring up good policy, publish uh, political platform, and we publish the Green Book. The Green Book. And there are 125 policies. And we were able to as I mentioned, to put candidates in our program to reduce our party to urban villages and also to especially to promote our policy 
to the, to the people. And when we were not able to get enough work, uh, to get our resources not free in the National Assembly, but it, it, was a very, it was the first start for us. And we, as I said, began experience and we, we were able to build our network uh, throughout the country, especially uh, our good policy. Uh, slowly, slowly, well known and accepted by more and more people. And we continue, we have been, and we continue to face bigger challenge for, the, for our work. The first challenge is that, as you may know, that the dominance of the ruling party with political power and resources, and they have a very strong power network from village until uh, national level. We are still uh, accepted belief and mindset that involving politics is very dangerous. You would be killed, you would be arrested, or you would be expelled out of the country. And it's difficult for us to mobilize active citizens to involve in our political work. And we also experience uh, example like in 2016, one of our co-founders, Dr. Kamlai, was also killed. So, but because of this, you know, because we are committed to, to continue our journey without fear, and we, we want to set example of the people that uh, politics is not bad, it's not dangerous, it's politics is about uh, doing medicine for the society, as I mentioned before, about the youth of the culture. And another challenge is how to gain trust from citizens as, as to present to prove that we are truly independent party. We come with people, a level, follow us, you know, as a, as a party to serve the interest of the real party. So we have to prove that we are really independent, that we are party, have vision, have core value, as policy, as everything I will go uh, with. So, in spite of this challenge, we, we, we see a lot of opportunity, we have a lot of hope and confidence in, uh, in, in the Cambodian citizen, and we, we continue, as I said, our journey, and we will uh, com compete in the next election in 2022. Keep in mind that we want to get a possibility to lead the local government at any particular commune to, to develop example of democratic governance. And we continue to educate people about our Facebook, about our core value, about our vision, about our under 25 uh, policy, focus on national reconciliation, nation building, and national defense focus on the economy and labor sector, focus on the health care sector, education and youth, focus on the social welfare issue, and especially on the democratic government into public service for every citizen and so on. So based on our experience in political work with GDP in the last, let's say, four to five years, we can say that our work, our political party work, can lead to gradual social and political change for the world. And it is not about rushing to grab power for the sake of power, pollution, and money. You see, political change, social change is a process oriented and it takes time and patience in introducing new political culture, especially in political empowerment for, of local leaders throughout the country in our sector. It can take more than 20 years to lay this kind of good foundation. As our logo with the theory, you know, it's a more bottom-up approach to lay a strong foundation at the graphic level. But we do know that if we, are, we have been successful in one commune in developing 
เมื่อเดินไอ้สัมผัสเป็นไม่ติดเป็นกระตาติดกายนั้นเดี๋ยวสักเส้นอินวันผมยืนแคมบริดมาสักเส้นอินเท่าสำหรับผมยืนอันเป็นมีสักเส้นที่เดี๋ยวเดินนักงานเลยเลย and we are expecting to get a person to be in the next election in 2022 to prove our commitment to build ideal democratic society in a n i c o m m u n e of Cambodia. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kun Goma. But to have uh, Kun Yang Sang Goma talking uh, to this uh, event is very special because he is very busy, and he told uh, his um, his uh, members of the parties uh, uh, where he is going to where he is going to talk, so people can watch. Uh, he's uh, a chair of the uh, GDP party. So he, if the GDP uh, will join the election in the, uh, actually in 2018, if the GDP won the election, he would be prime minister. So what he has been telling us is why he left uh, the NGO uh, that he founded. So he, he was a great courage to jump into the political uh, circle. And many people uh, question his decision, but uh, Goma was clear that he, was, he, uh, he doesn't want to grab power or actually uh, rush to do that. He wants the people to have uh, space to be able to participate uh, in the change. Uh, you have seen the picture of his colleague uh, who was killed. He, he was a DJ, he works as a DJ, and he was out in one morning at a coffee shop, he was killed, uh, shot, and when he, the, mm, Millions of people actually went over to where he was killed to pay respect to him. So even though Goma says, uh, Goma still says that he doesn't believe that politics is all violent, he believes that uh, it can be a good thing to the people. So, so that's an interesting a presentation on uh, democracy, the issue of democracy. So we will go to the next two uh, speakers. I would like to invite Kuntara Buokamsi, so uh, director of Greenpeace Thailand. Greenpeace is well known in Thailand. So I asked Kuntara to go first because he, he will speak about quite broadly about um, politics and climate justice in the Mekong region. So he'll be the only person talking directly about climate change. So please go ahead. First, uh, thank you, Kun Yang, uh, for inviting me. And also the teamwork uh, for male. On the environment uh, issue, uh, democracy and livelihoods uh, for this Macron ASEAN Environmental Week this year, I think uh, very relevant to the situations we are facing today. What I would like to present on climate justice. It's not a new issue. And the word global warming uh, is already well known. So I want to use the uh, other word that is the climate, just, climate crisis. 
instead, because climate crisis is is situated in the time, in every time and place we go, in people's mind, in uh, in the budget of the government, in the government policies. We, we every day we talk about uh, how we should change our behaviors. Uh, at the same time, we are experiencing the extremes of climate crisis uh, every day, which brings uh, the problem about the future, wh what we can see uh, in the future. Uh, so global warming and climate crisis have been actually stripped of political issues because uh, it, it comes down to uh, changing the, your light bulbs to LED, for example, which is uh, a shame. When, when we talk about climate uh, uh, challenges and about when uh, already we already talked, Bremerty talked about the large dams on mainstream Macomb and the policies uh, on uh, forest uh, and uh, eviction of people from the forest and other development uh, projects. For example, the erosion prevention, coast, coastal erosion prevention and issues. They, I just want to start with, uh, as I said, climate justice is not a new issue. It started with the movements on uh, climate justice actually started with climate negotiations 20 years ago. Um, at that time, there was a, the conference of the parties uh, at The Hague, and it was the conference that actually recognized that um, climate change was the, the issue of climate change involved rights as well. And then the, the, then the Johannesburg uh, COP, uh, there was the uh, adoption of the Bali principle. Then later on in the COP, uh, the Conference of the Parties at Bali, the, that's where the climate justice movement uh, was born. And we also have the climate justice movement in Thailand. But the most outstanding was the one in Copenhagen. That was when the climate justice movement uh, made the, the biggest uh, show. Uh, I think all of you probably also joined that, uh, that uh, movement. But we were disappointed uh, with all the civil disobedience and all the demonstrations that we organized and all the slogans about system change, not climate change. But the negotiation uh, actually failed, uh, the, the official negotiation. So later on, the Bolivia uh, proposed a people's agreement as an alternative to, uh, to address uh, climate change. Then in Poland uh, a few years ago, later on you could see that younger people uh, join uh, uh, join uh, the Greta Thunberg in uh, protesting. Bali principle, uh, it is clear where that climate change is about the people's rights to protect their own livelihoods. It's not about uh, commercializing resources. So then the climate justice movement uh, proposed uh, uh, six principles and these principles still are relevant today about keeping fossil fuel in the ground, about getting attention to uh, development, um, developing countries, 
And uh, what's important, uh, interesting, is that to stop the role of the industries uh, in the negotiation at the negotiation table. So the next slide will show the that the climate justice movement has uh, it's been going on, uh, accompany, uh, on accom accompanying climate litigation. Climate litigation is a bit uh, difficult to see on the slide, but you can uh, you can see that there are. Uh, 1,587 cases, lawsuits being filed across the world in 28 countries, uh, but mainly they are in the U.S. About three quarters of them are in the U.S. And the the uh, the the, the plain, uh, those that are being uh, sued uh, are the governments, and at the same time. The investors also filed their own lawsuits to count counter lawsuits as well. So we can see. Can I have the next slide? You can see that on the right. In, in the map, the map on the right, no, the, the left, sorry, the left, it's uh, the number of laws related to global warming. Every country has several laws. They are called uh, climate change laws, not really related to climate, but it could be for uh, forest and, and uh, land. And the other map uh, will show where the lawsuits are actually being filed. But you can see that the majority are in the US and Europe. And, and the, the two issues about it's a strategic move to file lawsuits in order to push for policy change and to change the policy of the companies the business co uh, operations. So uh, you can see that uh, human rights uh, is actually uh, being um, cited uh, along uh, in this lawsuit. Now, and, and an in interesting case is about the, now that the private companies actually include climate risks uh, in their business models as well. But what is uh, still challenging is that there are not enough evidence to show the, 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 the for climate change that could be used in, in the lawsuits. So, so the lawsuits could be a strategic uh, to trying to push for transparency and also to upscale the debate uh, at the policy level. But what is challenging still, but we still have to work on it, is that these climate lawsuits takes about five to 10 years and it co its cost is high. And also you can get, you can get counter lawsuits uh, filed by the companies, that is to, to try to uh, keep us quiet. And this map uh, uh, not just, it's about uh, Asia, Southeast Asia. Just the map shows, if you look in the details, uh, We have uh, the we have uh, data that uh, in this table that shows the ten ASEAN countries, not including Timor Leste. We have this is about the number of environment or, or climate related laws. We've got lots of policies. The number of policies are there, but. Uh, 
but the cases that are being found uh, that's related to climate change uh, are very few. There's one in the Philippine, uh, in Indonesia, two in the Philippines, and and the in the number of you can see the the last column. Uh, if you have that shows the risks that the Southeast Asian nations uh, face uh, from climate change. This is uh, about all the costs that occurred in the last uh, two, three decades. Uh, that, that's in the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia. So the costs and damages uh, uh, of events related to climate change, that means the loss of lives as well as uh, properties and affected uh, people, the number of affected people. These are the, we, the, the, all the figures have been calculated in terms, in terms of millions of baht. You could see that we still have gaps uh, in terms of the data. What I said earlier, in Indonesia, there was one climate uh, change lawsuit uh, in Bali. When you go to Bali, uh, you will not see this uh, power plant, uh, but, uh, but this um, coal-fired power plant uh, is being built there. The local government wanted to expand the power plant, so the villagers um, sued uh, the uh, Bali municipality, uh, saying that they cannot do it because of climate change. And But the court actually uh, um, dismissed the case for lack of, ev for insufficient evidence. So I think, uh, only 30% of the lawsuits actually uh, were successful. Another thing that is related to uh, lawsuits on climate change, uh, this, uh, they are targeted at uh, what we call carbon majors that are the big players in the, uh, in the carbon field. Uh, about 100 companies uh, large mining companies um, that are responsible for emitting um, greenhouse gases up to about 71%. So the other, the rest of the emission are just uh, ordinary people. These are really large players. Uh, there is one uh, lawsuit being filed uh, that are, that is targeted uh, these large players. One is apart from uh, fossil uh, fossil fuel industries, there are also related industries like the plastic industries. So it shows that if we target uh, changing people's behaviors, ordinary people's behaviors. Uh, instead of actually targeting the key players, uh, that will uh, it will be a missed opportunity. So, just to show the example of what, what the lawsuit looks like, uh, targeting these carbon majors. I have to go back. I'm not sure if I'm able to open this. Okay, so it's fine. So in Philippines, there is a, a human rights committee in 2015, a green peace there, worked together with the community and the civil society, hundreds of them working together to uh, file a lawsuit against fossil uh, companies, uh, totaling uh, 47 companies, big companies, because they are playing a big role in the impact 
uh, in terms of climate change in the Philippines uh, they, that leads to um, typhoon and all the storms. So the Human Rights Committee uh, took the case and then they opened a forum. Uh, I mean, they, they opened the case and investigated uh, in New York and also in England, in London. In London, they have a headquarter of big companies like Shell. I'm not sure if it's Shell, the other one. And in New York as well. But no one came. And so the investigation was uh, being in progress to find whether these 47 companies have a role or influence uh, in terms of creating a big negative impact on the climate change. This investigation started from 2015 uh, until now. So we, we still didn't get any conclusion on that case. So there was a commissioner, uh, a human rights commissioner uh, knows that these 47 companies plays a big role, but they didn't conclude it yet because uh, because of COVID situation. I believe that in two or three months from now, we will see what's going to happen. And the litigation on carbon major in Philippines will be a good example, an uh, important example uh, that would help uh, uh, with the movement on this issue on Asia and Southeast Asia in general. So please uh, go to the next slide. The other one that I would like to share is that apart from uh, what Kendi has talked about the big projects uh, in the ASEAN region, in the Mekong Basin, we found out outside of China, in this region, Asia, uh, Southeast Asia region, it is a big uh, target place to for a coal power plant to uh, establish. So this number is more than India, more than Turkey, more than Bangladesh, and more than anywhere else in the world except for China. So this is a big uh, fight on energy sector, on fossil fuels. But uh, this project is concentrated on uh, Indonesia and Vietnam. Thailand uh, is like a, 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 a secondary uh, place. Uh, the neighbor that, uh, Thailand's neighbor, Lao, we just uh, signed uh, with the Laotian government um, they say that it's going to be uh, done in seven years. It is, it is in one of the places in Laos. Uh, the investment is done by in, in uh, Malaysian companies. So because Hong um, Sa Lake Night may be of Laos. So now they are planning on the second plant, and the cable would be connected to uh, through Vietnam or maybe to Thailand uh, through Bon Ratchathani, or it would be connected to uh, Cambodia. So there would be a bit of contradiction because Sekong is a really poor province, but it is uh, connected to the border of Vietnam and they should have uh, uh, coal sources there. So this is something that is very interesting. So it will uh, lead to what we will discuss in the future, whether we can uh, pursue this uh, climate change lawsuit. And the last issue that I would like to uh, share with you, uh, this one is not co consistent with what I said earlier, but when you, we talk about uh, climate change crisis, first, it has been uh, diminished uh, in, in the political aspect, in the justice aspect. But the important issue is that every many cities in this world is more aware and alert of trying to push this into uh, a policy. Uh, for example, in Thailand, we learned that, that we will have a global warming law 
but this law doesn't say anything. It just says that there would have to be data collection, reduction in greenhouse gas. They don't talk about justice aspects or community aspects, or they would not address the contradiction about uh, in minor cases, like when uh, the villagers go and look for or collect mushrooms that may be litigated against in that case uh, for global warming, for creating global warming. So, so we have to think about how we can push this into a policy. That I think that uh, it would require the mechanism in the parliament, but maybe we don't have so much hope for that, but we still have to work on the justice aspect of the climate change uh, so that it is not, uh, it's moving from uh, marginalized uh, subjects into something that can be mainstream in the uh, political policies in ASEAN. So I would like to end here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kuntara. So the, the mission on climate change is very complicated. The other day I heard that Thai, someone said that Thailand is surviving this crisis. But actually, um, when we talk about the risk, we cannot actually compete with those in the maritime uh, uh, areas or in the Mekong region area. Thailand, Thai people always think that they are in the safe zone, but it's not true. But it, uh, as Kuntara has said, many people are following on this matter, including the journalists. I would like to open the floor so that the journalists can ask Kuntara on the issues that he has just uh, talked about earlier. Uh, at the back, please go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Uh, it'd be better if you do so. My name is Bom Yomat. I'm not a journalist, but I would like to ask Kuntara because we have political limitations, so much limitations. The movement on this issue, how can we actually do it? One thing that I think from, from the situation that just happened. I think that we may have to create a movement in terms of like a road side politics. It's not like we go protest on the roads, but the process in the parliament uh, will have to continue as usual. Although it seems hopeless, but we should not be lose our hope. We may wait for the next round or the next time. But how do we? I think in Thailand's case, I just thought about the lawsuit that the uh, people were uh, sued against. Recently, there was a um, mother uh, that the court uh, said that she inf uh, encroached on the forest areas. That case, if we work uh, in interconnectedly, we collect the data and find the proper evidence and come up with like a, an evidence to to show that uh, when the forestry department uh, sue them for deforestation is very contradictory because the 100 companies that emit 70% of the gases uh, in the world, they actually there are actually some Thai companies in there. I, I, would, say, I would say the name is Banpo. It's a big company. They invest in Mongolia and etc. How do we come up with the evidence that that shows that the villagers are refrain from their rights of the, their livelihood is different from the fact that the company, some big companies have influence on the policy and is, they are actually the, uh, 
the main guy who create this impact. So how how do we enhance these cases and make it uh, like a tools for the community to fight and for those who has got impact to fight so that they can work on this issue. A lot of ha things that happens like mining, uh, mines and fossil fuels and etc. If we can find a good evidence and connections, we can make it a national climate lit litigation. But the important condition is in what uh, forum or what uh, cha opportunity can we do this? Because we cannot actually rely on the existing system or mechanism. I don't want to talk much about it. But you have to think of the way, what are the, uh, the ways that we, uh, like, maybe a human rights forum and etc to, uh, to 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 work on this I, I think that to answer your question we have to uh, do, do more variety of, of politics on the road so there is very correct that we have to talk about democracy and politics we have about 20 minutes before 12:30. Uh, that is so let's utilize this time so i'd like to invite kun pen chom Tang, the last speaker of this morning kun pen chom Tang. i think you know her uh, well she works on pollution and industrial uh, factories uh, for a long time. Now, Kupen Chom is the uh, director of Murana Niwed Foundation or, or Earth. The um, topic is uh, pollution and cross-border. Uh, so the topic would be continuation of Kun Ta Tara. Like to please let me remove the mask, otherwise I wouldn't be able to speak. Please go to the next slide. The topic that we to were talking about today is on the uh, uh, environment, livelihood, and natural resources. I'd like you to take back, take you back to the history. Actually. Um, the word uh, environment and the importance of humanity. Uh, this topic has been raised in the World uh, Forum in 1972, 40 years ago. So at the time, many of you may know about Minamata disease, a uh, catastrophe that happened to humanity caused by industry. And there was a uh, um, there were many Japanese, thousands of Japanese who died from this disease, which uh, was caused by the chemical fertilizer and petrochemical fertilizer industry. Apart uh, from the, so uh, they took all these patients to uh, the UN conference, the human environment. That is the first time of the history that was raised that environment was raised. Um, and in the conference in Stockholm in 1972, there were uh, 26 principles, there were action plans that have recommendations on uh, the natural resource environment management and uh, on democracy. Uh, and mainly on environment, they, were, they talked about how each country should set a standard value of the pol uh, of the pollution in the country uh, a benchmark so it depends on how their each country set their own values it is the responsibility of the government to protect their own natural resources and this is the first time uh, that they talked about this after the industrial revolution revolution uh, before that, they talked about uh, 
economic, society, and politics, I mean, before 1972. And after that, after the catastrophe in uh, Japan, uh, after the discovery of Minamata disease in uh, during that time, before the world even know it, it was not until 1972, we talked about the, how to remedy the damage done to the environment. And the other uh, point is uh, to consider the potential of the environment that can, uh, because they could cure themselves and heal themselves. So in this, con that's the issues discussed in that conference. And in 1992, in 1992, I think many of you already know it is a conference uh, called the Earth Summit, conducted by UN on environment. Uh, it's the biggest one that we had uh, so far until then. Before that, there was never. Uh, such a big conference. There were many delegates from many countries, and uh, there were discussion uh, on ongoing discussion on the um, declaration and agenda 21. Those are uh, Im important things uh, for us. So for the uh, declaration, there are three main principles that says that from now on, the world would move forward and uh, they would help develop the society, uh, economy, and whatnot. But in order to move forward, they would need three main principles. Otherwise, we would face a lot of disasters. So that is in 1992. So the earth will, will move, be able to move forward sustainably, will require people's participation in policy level in terms of uh, policy protection, and the people will need to be able to access information and data um, for the decision-making process in uh, environment process. So these are the three main principles that is very ideal and to in order to turn it into the action plan we have to see the agenda 21 and that will talk in detail uh, that each government will have to uh, take this three pr uh, principle in the uh, Leo declaration and the uh, action plan by UN to to be a guiding principle uh, for the practices and there is a evaluation that the uh, there were review on uh, this issue in 1997 on Earth Summit plus five, and the review shows that principles are principle plans are plans. There is no progress. This is something that uh, raised people's awareness and questions that why are these three main principles are not actually creating any positive impacts or Agenda 21. It is just like a Bible of the developers, right? It is the develop, uh, like a Bible for two and a Bible for a principle of guidelines. But why are there no progress on environments and there's no participation uh, from the people side as well? So, and the overall environmental situation is worse. And some countries uh, may have better situation, but the overall picture is worse. So uh, we have gone through uh, this process. But one of the things that started, um, when we look at the conclusion of OSM plus five, we see that there were discussions on uh, the fact that when we discuss about the environment, it has to go together with economic development, because uh, in, or, in other words, environment cannot uh, affect uh, the economic development. So the resolution, there was something added to the resolutions of the UN uh, that uh, we have to give importance to uh, the environment and we have to add this issue, environmental issue uh, to uh, trade liberalization. Tr trade liberalization started in 1977 and which says that from now on global trade will be uh, free and with the condition that every country 
that have the FTA will have to protect the environment. When you listen to it, it sounds good, but in real reality, it's a bit a different story. After uh, they assess the pro that the progress. Uh, there is no progress, so they connect the environmental issue with trade, and they would have to also uh, destroy all the trade barriers as well. And in t 2012, there were uh, UN conference as well as called Leo Plus 20, and as Kuntara said earlier, it uh, was on global imp uh, impact of global warming that has a, that. Uh, and we have another thing called green economy. We hear about it a lot, uh, especially nowadays. It's like green economy or eco uh, industry or something like that. But l let's look at the reality what, of what it has happened. In 2012, the, we, the, it was a year that they laid the foundation and framework of how we can set the goals for sustainable development. In 2012, is the founded is the year of foundation and framework. And um, in 2019, they uh, announced as the 19 SDGs. There are hundred of objectives, and there were action plans for 2030. This is the uh, overall picture of what has been in the UN conference, and many governments uh, accepted it. Uh, and please move on to the next slide. Apart from, please go on the next slide. Apart from the UN conference, there were many conventions. Uh, that was being created each time uh, each of the UN conference there were discussion at least to um, the convention about, uh, between countries. Basel a convention is the first one that relates to environmental issues. Basel actually uh, ha originated before Earth Summit because uh, the developing countries like Latin America cannot stand the fact that uh, America uh, carried over hazardous waste and dump it in their countries. Uh, and also like Amer Latin America and Africa uh, combine their forces together and fight with those uh, industrial con countries. But the Basel uh, Convention has limitations, which I will not go into detail. Um, uh, next, uh, we have UNFCCCC, as Kuntana has talked about uh, a bit already. And then we have, and then we have Kyoto uh, Protocol, which was done on uh, 2005. As we all know, that uh, Thailand, uh, USA didn't ratify this, and then we have Stockholm uh, uh, Convention. Uh, it was developed in two, one, 2001 and was effective in 2004. Stockholm has a uh, convention has uh, another part of, of importance. Uh, so uh, they tried to reduce uh, downs in substance and some substances. It is very important uh, for uh, to control each country to emit uh, these substances into the environment because they can flow from one country to another country. Um, so I forgot another one, Minamata. Uh, convention on mercury uh, sub substance from what happened in one 1956 uh, there came Minamata conference uh, convention um, they want to control the uh, transmission of uh, of uh, mercury in the industry and Petroleum company also released this uh, mercury into the environment. Actually, uh, the mercury that what that is being released from the coal power plant can be a uh, flow through uh, to other countries because it can travel like that. And so this may not be in Tha Thailand, but it doesn't mean that we are safe from it. Our team has collected uh, information and and see the uh, levels in uh, Thaburi. We collected uh, some fish in the top of the mountain. 
because that is like a pure water. And, but we found that there was a, a really high uh, amount of the substance in Jantaburi. And we cannot answer why we find such a high uh, value of my mercury in Jantaburi uh, fish. But I understand that the mercury can travel to, through the air. So this is the, one of the findings that we, we found that even if you are not an industrial city, it's not like you're safe because they can travel through the air. I would like to go back um, when the uh, when many people ratified the principles. What happened after that? Many principles uh, are for people and countries to comply so that the world can be more secure and sustainable. But um, you can you can observe that in 1972 to 1992, there were no uh, sustainable consumption or production plan. So for these country, um, there's no sustainable plan, to, and their what their what their current practice is still uh, destroy the environment, and there were. We don't have; they don't have enough tools and natural resources to help us help protect the natural resources. So um, the uh, format of uh, environmental the, the advantage taking was worse. From what we see is that first the import uh, export the uh, of. Uh, uh, dirty investment. For example, Thailand. We receive a lot of this. Some Thailand, uh, some sometimes Thai countries move to to Myanmar, but uh, some area in Thailand uh, do the upstream industry that cause toxic to the environment. This is what happened. And the second part is that to create double standards. Uh, for information, information giving, for example, America, uh, G Germany, Japan, they have the laws that people can access pollution data. We have done, we, we have asked for this information before in Thailand from Bayong, but um, we never got this information because Thailand never had this law uh, before. Uh, for Japanese and Europeans to get, because Japanese and Europeans get have this law, uh, so they can get this information. But Thailand doesn't have this law, so we are not able to access this information. But the 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 last one is uh, sending recycle waste to the developing countries. So these waste uh, could is treated as a, a type of product. Um, Please go to the next one. Next slide, please. And this is the example, one of the examples you can see that uh, this map shows the addresses that exports waste uh, to recycle. For, you can see that there are some from there are many ways from Australia, America to th China. They export all kind of ways uh, to China. That's before China ha has announced the prohibition of uh, importing of waste. Please go ahead to the next slide. This is the study from one of the agency under the Ministry of Industry of Japan. And you will see that the if you see this, there would be like a circular um, uh, area here. So they uh, this points out how China would be important uh, in terms of receiving waste from J Japan and other countries to recycle, recycle, and other ASEAN countries also have play an important role in this. And this is the study uh, report of Interpol that was released in August this year. And from what, from the fact that China closed their country and have the law to prohibit 
prohibition of import of waste to to recycle or dispose in China. There was an influx of waste into Thailand and other countries in ASEAN regions. You can see that the red circle are the countries that import waste uh, after Ch Ch uh, China prohibits the import of waste. You can see that uh, they changed to ASEAN and Australia and America and Europe and Japan. They used they used to export to China, but now they change to Southeast Asia. And this is a, another slide that Interpol has done. Um, waste trade, ex example, plastic electronic and uh, plastic electronic waste and etc. In the ASEAN region itself, there is a circulation of this waste as well. If you can see the red circle and the gray circle, that's the intercontinental uh, movement of the waste, but the target is ASEAN uh, in Southeast Asia region. And so Interpol has worked on this because they discovered that, that there are some crime and illegal acts that relates to import and exporting plastic waste and electronics waste. So they have 257 routes of this uh, trade routes. Uh, and the main countries uh, are in the Southeast Asia regions. And the export, there are about 57, uh, 57 countries who are the exporter of these weights. This is the new type of crime that is coming in, becoming a trend. And this is the conclusion of the Interpol that worked together with 40 countries. So this country, this data is based on 39 countries. Um, this is from uh, our study from that year. Uh, we import, we conclude the importation of plastic waste from overseas. We actually have done more than 100 items, items, but this picture is only showing plastic. But Thailand import. 80 uh, import plastic from over 80 countries. Japanese, Japan, Hong Kong, America sent waste to Thailand. In five years' time, they export 900,000 plus tons. Actually, in China and Hong Kong, they stop uh, prohibits the importation, but actually there is some transit going on there and being sent here. Uh, in Thailand. Please go on to the next slide. You will see that the peak there, when this is the real impact um, that was created, uh, uh, was caused by the prohibition of import of plastic waste, uh, of waste in China, China. Because before that, you can see that the imports, uh, be before that, the importation of plastic waste in Thailand is not that much. It's about 30 to 70 tons thousand times, but when China closed, uh, prohibits the importation, it go, it went up to 550,000 tons, and because and then it went down because there were complaints, there were um, a lot of reports from the journalists, and therefore the government set up the working force and do a study uh, so that they can stop uh, importation of plastic waste from other countries, and this is something that me and Kuntara has been uh, campaigning about. And this is a picture of the community that come out and protest uh, the recycle cycling of waste in China. And Ch China, they moved the country. Many Factories in Thailand moved to Thailand and to the neighboring countries, and in, in the mail in the mail's uh, area country, Thailand is the main uh, target, and the uh, this is the factory in Chonburi. So this is another case. Please go to the next slide. I will go fast, and the. The, w the waste that we got from uh, ex plastic, from electronic waste, etc., it would be landfilled in Chonburi. We found six spots. Uh, 
we have seen we have seen it in the area of four rice sixteen rice so uh, so come people uh bought this land and, and was trying to prepare the land for uh plantation but actually this guy got sued because uh, according to law the owner of the uh Hazara's waste is the culprit, so he got sued, but actually it's not his, um, his waste. So this is the case that we want to litigate within this month. I'm not sure if uh, the case will be prepared in time. And this is the recycling of industrial waste. Actually, it, it damaged many uh, rubber plantations, and from what you see, it cannot be recovered. So so we ha we have to actually it it actually never happened the fact that we said that we will have to let the environment heal itself and etc actually the un is the is the main person who doesn't really care about others because we went to Copenhagen asking for data, but we cannot get access to that information. We get blocked all the time. Under democracy, it is something that is really fake for us, that they work on uh, environment. What is justice? What is in, in what is quality, equality? The, so um, let me move on to the next, uh, the last slide. Oh, oh okay, it's not last yet. Um, participation, justice, and access to justice system. This is what happened in two, uh, in uh, five years ago. So this, the people uh, oppose the public hearing. This is what we actually happen in uh, the community level. This is what really happened in the community and it actually stays all the time. So the principles in the old declaration, the principle of green economy and et cetera, whatever happens in the US, at UN conference and then uh, the government or these are, um, these are not fair. So this is the reality that happened. Um, there are four, uh, 40, 50 men who went and attacked like women in the area. This is the same area as uh, that I showed you earlier. So this is the last slide. I'm trying to uh, come up with recommendations and solutions. I cannot really come up with uh, the solutions or the recommendations. Kuntara has already uh, recommend that uh, the people should participate in politics more. Um, actually, the community cannot stop fighting. This is the reality that we face uh, for the past 20 years. We know that this this crisis is unstoppable. Whenever the community is in despair and cannot fight anymore, the environment will be damaged right away. So each area, each person or each community will have to come up and fight to protect the, their own livelihood and their environment. That is a real sustainable development. Without these people in the community, uh, COVID, air, what do you think people will go to when COVID happened? They would have nowhere to go to. In 1997, in the Tom Yam Gong crisis or the previous crisis, when they don't have anywhere to go back to, they can go back to their hometown in the rural area. That is something that can help support them in the hardship. Um, but when we go back to an environment and natural resources, everyone will have to look start looking and taking care of this matter thank you Kun Penchom. this is a very important topic i would not have to uh, conclude because she showed uh, us to see the fakeness of the policy compared to what actually happened uh, in the community but actually it's 12 30 now but i think you have some questions so uh, please go ahead please introduce yourself Hi, 
um, Tana from Bangkok Post. I would like to ask the two speakers, do I understand it correctly that the, uh, the, the decay of environments shows the weakness of uh, in the democracy? Is that why Kuntara recommend that we have to find like to to go on to street politics do i understand it correctly that is directly related so shortly answering you i think that is an equation that is uh, connecting to each other like kupen chop has talked about the procedures uh, on environmental globalization what thailand's have on in terms of policy or laws or mechanisms but uh, when there was political change uh, and the power was centralized we have uh, the elite in thailand which is uh, onep and history of natural resource and environment and as Kun Pen Shop has said that they talk about all these wonderful things sustainable development and whatnot but you know on the trans border uh, uh, pollution and etc I think that these are connected to one percent of the people who dominate the, a good number of natural resources so the policy that comes out would be corresponding to that the degradation of the environment is the result of the policy decision that came up I'm not sure if it's the weakness of democracy or not, but the capitalists are stronger and they'll be more complicated. For example, if you say that uh, if Thailand has more uh, a, a, a regulation on public hearing and etc., but in the reality, uh, the politicians and capitalists are really close, very close. So they will think of ways. These two people, they will have to think how to twist the law, how to evade the laws, because they they write their own laws. And they write it so nicely, but actually, in practice, they they just evaded it. Uh, the community fights until they got the uh, human rights commissioner and etc but we have one set of commission and after that we will be undermined and then uh, dismissed in the future if we uh, fight a lot they will think a lot they will be smarter and then they can destroy this mechanism they can i have to admit that they ha it can really damage it because uh, these days, I don't care about having um, a, a free organization or a voluntary organization. So, uh, because it doesn't help with the uh, uh, the income e equality uh, on global warming, as Kuntara have said, why are there no cases in Thailand? Because actually, Thailand has global warming cases, but it's the case where the where where the community gets litigated it's very bad because thailand is the place where like community can get attacked or litigated if the people in the village uh, burn something they get arrested but the actual industry industrial plants they never get fined or arrested but if it's the villager or general people they would be fined thousands of thousands of months but which is very very severe so i don't know if it's the weakness of democracy or if it's the smartness of the uh, government and the capital capitalists and the community is going down so i don't see w where we can stop fighting actually next 
So the, the democracy co contains of three parts, right? The justice, uh, administrative, and uh, legislative, right? And if it's weak, if Thailand is weak, we have to try to push this uh, mechanism and make it more stronger. So, uh, I mean, these three parts, legislative, administrative, <laughs> we all know that the legis how the legislative part is, how the parliaments are. So, uh, for the justice part, I'm very, very angry. We are, uh, account we were appointed to, be, I'm appointed to be the uh, specialist um, evidence uh, against the better working company. I did everything, I fought everything because it happened 10 years ago already. Going back to documents and proving that this factory actually damaged the environment is really hard to do because I have to do everything until one point I got all the documents and I proposed the, to the court that we have to go to the, to the area and, and prove it too because the pollution subject is hard in two or three years time. It's hard to uh, prove already. So I told the court that we have to go to the factory to prove. And I know that they uh, took uh, the public area. We took the court there. And um, the court is very careful. Uh, to talk to us or to the community, but they they're never careful um, when they talk to the companies. But in the end, I was dismissed because uh, with the reason that I took to took the side of the villagers too much, because the court said that they do not want my name as a a witness anymore because me as a witness, we took, I took the side of the uh, villagers too much. But because I'm related to many uh, environmental uh, lawsuits and stuff, uh, we know that the mindset of the court, of the judges have problems. They do not view the community as equal, be they view the community as something that is so demanding if the, they want if we they grant something they want something else or something else and so so the i see that many gov uh, former government official who retired uh, and or early retired or uh, became the advisor of these uh, uh, companies and we have to fight with them. This is the reality. We have talked to lawyers that we would have to do the work more proactively. We may have to uh, ask to meet, meet the president of the uh, Supreme Court so that uh, they can actually educate the personnel in the justice side, uh, especially on the pollutions on, or on hazardous substances, because this is not something that can be easily proved. Um, so the justice side is not different than other two parts. We cannot rely on them. We cannot de depend on them. Um, so uh, our discussion has become very heated. So thank you, Kun Pen Chom. Uh, to end our morning session and we get all these wonderful thoughts uh, when we talk about the pollution in the country it is quite um, interesting to follow up i think that everyone in our team would have to take our lunch because we have one hour break but i'd like to take one minute for Kunsukanya to advertise the uh afternoon program. Thank you for the speakers in the morning session. Please give them big hands. In the afternoon, after we talked, uh, we, we listened to the overview of the democracy and environment, there would be tomorrow, uh, in the afternoon, we will have a panel uh, discussion of the jo uh, environmental journalists and then we would have we would have a documentary on environment. We'll be back here again on one thirty, and 
for the first one is uh, on sharing experience of environmental journalists um, moderated by Kun Udom Get Gao and uh, there will be other four panelists Kun Anjali from Bangkok Post and we'll be back uh, on at 1 30 and then they would have another panelist discussion panel uh we would meet the artist uh who photographed all these photos and we will end uh, with playing the documentary and short clip thank you for the morning session we'll meet again at 1 30. thank you I understand that uh, the I I, w I know that some people have to leave, so I'd like you to uh, fill in the survey uh, questionnaire in the front. It's an online questionnaire. Uh, please scan.